look at two passages of scripture as our main text tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. I might be tempted to read a little bit more of that, but also 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Minister Micah, worship team, thank you so much. Yeah, see, I knew it. I'm, I'm going to have to take it from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And brethren, I, when I came to you, did not come with the excellency of speech or the wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. First Corinthians chapter four now, and verse 20, just one verse from that chapter, first Corinthians four, verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Power. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're going to do, what you've already done. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint this time, that you'd be so gracious to take a coal from your altar, Lord, to place it upon my lips, that even as I preach, as I speak, it would burn faith in the hearts of each and every one of us tonight, those online, those that will listen later by podcast or MP3, those here in the congregation, all under the sound of my voice. Lord, let us be forever changed. Because your word, in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God's power, it was expressed through the ministry of Jesus. In fact, everywhere Jesus went, he preached, the kingdom of God is at hand. If you read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the kingdom of God is, is near or the kingdom of God is at hand. That was the message of Jesus. There is uh, a book written by the name of George Ladd. I would encourage everybody to read it. It's about the kingdom of God. There's much confusion being taught and preached about the kingdom of God. Then some say it's here already in its fullness and some say it's not ever here or going to come and on and on. There's a lot of deception and doctrines of demons out there regarding the issues of grace and the kingdom of God. But if you look at the book of Genesis and all the way through the book of Revelation, you'll notice a, a common theme throughout the entire thing, and that's the kingdom of God. I want you to say the kingdom of God is at hand. Ready? One, two, three. The kingdom of God is at hand. God always desired a people. In fact, in the very creating of Adam and Eve, he did it in such a way that he would have relationship, that he would be, walk with Adam in the cool of the day, but Adam and Eve blew in. And so Noah came, a preacher of righteousness, if I could just speed you through the Old Testament just a little bit, but that failed also. Even though Adam and Eve, sin entered the world, Noah, a man, a preacher of righteousness, didn't have the Holy Spirit, didn't have the scriptures, he was, remained right before God built a boat. There was no boats. There was no rain. I mean, God used somebody who had never seen a boat to build a vessel that would basically carry man to safety. A, a picture, the ark is a picture of really salvation and waters, baptism, and so much more. But when Noah comes out of the ark and the process of time, sin is still in mankind. Ham commits some sort of sexual act against his father. And, and so we see throughout history, throughout the scriptures, you see God looking for a people. And, and, and there was Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And they walked by faith, but they always fell short. And Jacob had 12 sons. He had a name change at Peniel. His name was Israel. And Jacob had 12 sons, and those are the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And they wanted a king, even though God wanted to be their lawgiver, their judge, and their king. They wanted a king, so, so the Lord agreed and gave them a king just like the other nations. But that king, King Saul, he, he failed. And God raised up David, a young shepherd boy, and, and David failed. And on and on through history, it was prophesied by the prophets that God would send his one and only son, that God would send Emmanuel, God with us. Over 300 scriptures in the Old Testament that say that God would send his son to die in place of mankind. The sin entered through the first Adam, but it left through the last Adam to all who believe on him. He gave them the right to become sons of God, daughters of God, adopted and grafted in. It's the wonderful story of the good news of Jesus. Couldn't happen through through a human being, it had to happen through God himself, putting on his earth suit, if you will, and modeling what it really was, what God is really like, showing us. Walk the earth for 33 and a half years, cleansed the leper, healed the sick, set the captives free. Everywhere he went, he did miracles. Why? Because he's the king of the kingdom. And where the king is, so is the kingdom. So let me ask you before we move on. If you have Jesus in your heart, is he really in your heart? It's a not a trick question. The answer is yes. Okay. So does that mean is the king going to live on the inside of you? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So, so wherever you go really goes the kingdom. If you could just expand a little bit. Maybe not in its fullness. The fullness, I believe, will come. But not, not yet. But true still. Jesus being crucified for our sin. Rose again on the third day. Ascended to the heaven and sent it into the heavens and sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to fill your heart, to fill my heart, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Are you all with me? Say amen. amen. And the kingdom of God continued to be expressed, not only at the time of Jesus, but afterward through the early church. And through the name of Jesus, I just preached on the name of Jesus on Sunday. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus. And so they would speak and, and preach and declare and proclaim that the kingdom of God had come. And they would do miracles in the name of Jesus and all of that meant. And if you, didn't, if you weren't here Sunday, you need to get that as a, a foundational message about the name of Jesus and why we pray in Jesus' name. And why is there power in Jesus' name? And why don't we pray in the name of Bubba? The early apostles and Philip, and the early church, they did all kinds of signs and wonders in the name of Jesus and declared the kingdom of God is at hand. Now let's look at the text, if we can, and as we've moved through the introduction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, what's happening here is the apostle Paul, now let me just, I've, I've said this many times before, but just want to help you. When you read through the, the epistles, when you read through the letters, Greek name is epistle. You read through these, it's like listening to a one-way telephone conversation. You don't know exactly what has been said on the other side, but you can tell by, by what is being written what has been said. And there's other um, tools that we have to understand, but, but it's important to understand when he writes this, the Apostle Paul's defending himself against a segment of the church that sees man's wisdom and rhetoric as important in order to be accepted as a preacher. So he's defending himself. He says, man, it's not the eloquence of speech. Boy, this needs to be preached in the church these days because there's some folks that just think they're just waxing eloquent, tremendous teaching and all that. No power, no demonstration. And I'm all for good teaching. Amen. I'm all for teaching the Word of God. And if you're teaching the Encyclopedia Britannica, you should probably stop doing that. He's defending himself because the church saw the wisdom and rhetoric of man as more important than, than really anything else. And they, they had great orators like Apollos, who was a lawyer, trained in rhetoric. I mean, this guy, when he spoke, that was impressive. The Apostle Paul was not an orator, great scholar, not a public speaker. I don't know if he stuttered or whatever, but he just wasn't, a, apparently, I mean, you read through and study, you'll find he wasn't a real strong public speaker. And the Apostle Paul defends his ministry based on the demonstration of the Spirit's power. 
He's saying the ability to allow the Spirit of God move through you to touch people is what's important. Now, I, I'm encouraged by that. Sometimes I, I work on, and I don't think that we shouldn't, but sometimes we work on trying to say something so people really clearly understand it, but the same amount of prayer doesn't back up the message of a preacher. Prayer makes all the difference. But if there's no demonstration of the Spirit's power, something's wrong. Thank you, Pastor Karen. God bless you. I heard an amen from the front row. Can you say amen? amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, here Paul's opponents are arrogant, and they're talking against the apostle Paul, which is kind of amazing because he's the one that founded the church. And he says, when I, basically, if you, if you look, it says, when I come to you, we'll find out if they have power. I mean, that's kind of like... I mean, that's something Paul says, I'm coming. When I come to you, the Lord allows me. We'll find out if they have some power, these orators, these public speakers. And um, he says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but power. In, in the book of Acts chapter 13, and you can turn there if you like. Acts chapter 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts. Just kidding. Okay, Acts 13, verse 8. There's this uh, sorcerer here in the New King James, Elimus. I think in the NIV, his name is Bar-Jesus. And he is trying to keep the pro council from being saved. And so in verse 8, it says, Elimus the sorcerer, so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proud council away from the faith. And Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you're a son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind not seeing the sun for a time and immediately a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Tonight I just want to emphasize that it has nothing to do with whether you can be used as a public speaker with eloquence, and it has everything to do with the demonstration of the power of God. Unless, of course, you're trying to build some sort of intellectual gospel. And the gospel will stand up in intellect and for sure. I mean, it's amazing. The scriptures are amazing when you study them. There's no contradiction in them. They're inerrant, powerful, amazing. But, it, but just because you can't speak, maybe, doesn't mean you're disqualified. And I think that the teaching gift has been so elevated in the church that, that people are basically become unbelieving believers. And I've said this before. What do you mean by an unbelieving believer? I mean, they believe in Jesus, but they don't really believe in miracles because they don't see them too often. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody get up out of a coma, but that is one very exciting thing to see happen. I, I remember years ago, I was... I was I wasn't in full-time ministry yet. We were being trained, Pastor Karen and I, and there was a football injury and um, some kind of neck injury with a young, young Tongan kid. And even though he was young, he was still six foot four, 300 pounds or something. <laughs> He's like six foot four, 12 year old, you know, big Tongan or Samoan, pardon me. And uh, I got called by somebody in the church and said, Pastor, would you, you know, actually I wasn't a pastor. They just invited me. I was a life group leader, a small group leader, and they invited me to, the, to come pray at the ICU. I came into the ICU, and I know this is crazy, but I, I was just crazy. I'm, I'm still crazy, but I grabbed, my, I grabbed my little Benny Hinn CD. And truth is, it doesn't really matter what you think about Benny Hinn. That, the music I had that day was really annoying, and I could just get faith when I listened to it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, you don't like the way he combed his hair, that's fine. I'm not endorsing his whole ministry. I'm just saying this CD had God on it, you know. So I brought this CD, and uh, I went in, and there was a radio, and 
I cleared everybody out of ICU and I put on the Benny Hinn CD and I closed it and the parents were there and I asked them if I could pray. They said, do whatever you want. And so we start worshiping and worshiping and worshiping and I stand up. I don't know what it is, but sometimes I like getting up on chairs. So I got up on a chair and I stood over this young Samoan kid and I prophesied that he would serve the Lord. I prophesied he would come out of this thing. And I called him forth like Lazarus from the grave. And I, I kid you not, the kid was going to get up. In Jesus' name, rise! You know, I, mean, I was just full of fire. Yeah, nothing happened. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, it was just like, wow. Uh, you know, um, praise the Lord. You know, maybe God's doing a thing. And I was like, you know, God bless you. And I took my little CD. And, uh, you know, I just felt like the most defeated you know, I just felt like, man, I just felt defeated, and I felt like I'd done blown it. Except three days later, the boy got up. And I'm going to tell you something that taught me a lesson. He not only got up, he heard every single thing I said. Tears were coming down his face when we were yelling and shouting and screaming. And he, from the, my last report, which honestly is probably 16, 15 years ago, he went into ministry at that Samoan church. God healed him, raised him up, and he, and he walked into the blessings of God. Let me, let me tell you, if you're ever standing by somebody who says that they're dying or they can't hear, guess what? They can hear. And you take them by the hand, and I'll tell you what, what, I did, what I do, what I teach my staff to do, is you take them by the hand, and you say, you, you know, you might not live, and you might. I'm going to pray for you, believe for a miracle. Well, the first miracle is you need to give your heart to Jesus. And we're not waiting for them to talk back. Maybe they'll talk, maybe they'll get up right then, but it doesn't matter. And you take them by the hand, and there they are with their eyes closed, and you say, repeat after me. And you imagine him repeating after you, in the name of Jesus. So you wait. Forgive me of my sin. I believe you died in my place. Okay, you, you allow for pauses, and I'm going to tell you something. I've seen people get up, and I believe, I've seen tears. They said, they can't hear you, nothing's happening. I've seen tears run. I've had people say, no, there's no more motion. They've squeezed my hand. I've seen all kinds of miracle stuff like that. Come on, it's not, it's not about the eloquence of man. It's about the demonstration of the Spirit of God. So that, how many of you know, when somebody gets a miracle... That, they, that it does something in the hearts of somebody. I mean, when somebody gets a miracle in their own life or a prophetic word is spoken, it opens their heart. Faith is released. It's like, whoa, come on, God's on the throne. It does something to you. You try teaching demons, it doesn't work too good. I remember... I was a painter uh, before I went into full-time ministry. I was begging God, oh God, please deliver me from painting. I, want, I mean, really, I, I'd done my classes. You remember that, Pastor Karen? Just, oh Jesus, I don't want to work in the world. I just want to help people. I don't want to paint stuff over and over and collect my little check. And then, I, I, God, help me. That went on for like three years of crying out for God to deliver me from secular work. And then there's been times where we're like, Lord, can I just go painting now, Lord? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I would go to work, and I worked. These guys taught me to paint. They're two artisans, is what I would call them. Um, tremendous painters, house painters, but fine brushwork and, and multi-million dollar homes. And they were both from England, and both of them were atheists. And they loved me, and they hated me. And I remember showing up to work, and every Monday, I was just like, look what the Lord has done. Man, God did some great stuff. I just come in like, ah. You know, on fire, ready for a great week. They came in, nurse, still nursing their hangover, you know. So it's like they get to see, you know, you know, happy-go-lucky Christian boy. And, and they're constantly reminded of all of their stuff that they did over the weekend. So Monday was always a hard day, and they would throw things at me. Yeah, I'd be painting, and like, I'd get hit in the back of the head with a roll of tape. You know, it's just ongoing. Ongoing. Uh... And I remember uh, getting in the flesh one time. Um, I, I, I was, I've, I've, always, I've lifted weights for a long time. I'm not doing that so much now. But I was a pretty big boy back then. And I remember this guy said something. They were picking on me about my family. And picking on me about some of the stuff that had taken place. And, and um, 
and they made an accusation. They, they hit a nerve. You, you know what I mean? Is anybody, can you know what talking about? Y'all full of faith until, oh, you got a button there, right? So he hit a nerve, man. I came off my ladder and got in this guy's face. And, you know, it's just ready to just rip and send him to the hell that I thought he should go to. You know what I mean? And I repented. But something began to happen. I think I actually opened a door. But something began to happen on the job. At the end of the day, we would always go down to this, actually, a chicken coop. We'd go down to this chicken coop. And in the chicken coop, it was empty. There was no chickens. But that's where we stored uh, the thinner and the place where we cleaned all our, our brushes. And there was a lot of chemicals. And we would lock it at the end of the day so the little neighbor kids didn't get into it and so on and so forth. So I'm in this chicken coop, and the power of God comes on me. The presence of the Lord comes on me while I'm cleaning my brushes. And I begin to pray in the Spirit, and I take my brush, and I, I paint inside the chicken coop the name of Jesus. And I just do a little artwork up there. And, um, and the, the, that anointing sort of lifts. The following day, I go down to clean my brushes again at the end of the day. I come down, I sit down, I'm cleaning my brushes, and I look up, and here come these two boys, these two Englishmen. Both of them are carrying, oh, well, one guy had a pipe, and the other guy had a knife. So they come down to the chicken coop and they close the door and they lock me in. And they start hitting the side of the chicken coop with the pipe and screaming curses at me. And, you know, it kind of, and like, they're, they're joking at first, like, oh, let's, let's persecute the Christian. Let's persecute, let's persecute the Christian, you know, and they're, they're rattling the thing. And, and then it, it, it becomes demonically induced. It was sort of cute fun that the world would have with a little Christian at first, but they actually start working themselves up into anger. And they're really furious and they're rattling that thing. And all of a sudden, it was like this holy boldness came over me. I shot up at my feet and I prayed in some unknown language that I have never prayed in since then. And I turned that thing loose with power and authority. I let that, thing, I let that tongue go, wham! And it was like the whole place froze. And those guys are standing there and they're looking at me and the one guy drops his, drops his knife or pipe, I forget what it was, and he turns and runs up the driveway. He's gone. The other guy standing there and goes, what did you just say? I stood there with the fire of God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean a column of fire. I stood there, and he's like, oh, oh my God. And like, he, he didn't know what to do, but he reached for that little pin. It was actually a nail that held that hasp closed. He, he pulled the pin. He's like, <laughs> and I came out. Listen, you can try to talk yourself out of a situation. You can try to talk or use eloquence or you can try to bribe. There is a battle out there and I'm going to tell you that certain things just will not change unless you show up with some dynamite, some dunamis, some power. And the days of apathetic, lethargic, limp-wristed, powerless Christianity have come to an end. It really it needs to end. You need to decide in your heart, okay, there really is the power of God. And it doesn't just come through some guy that's up on a platform. These signs will follow them that believe, any believers and that believe in my name. So here's what I believe God's saying to us. God, what is God saying? That there should not be a separation between the preaching of God's word and signs and wonders. There shouldn't be a separation. See, so many are upset or, you know, there, there's been people that have just been a bunch of spiritual nut jobs. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? By that? You know, they're just weird, man. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You're like, it's my spouse. They're weird. Praise God. You can raise your hand, but there is a lot of weirdness out there. And as a result, what people have done in the name of trying to be dignified have thrown out the gifts of the Spirit, have thrown out miracles, signs, and wonders, and just we're just going to teach. We're just going to preach. The problem is, is that people stay bound, they stay addicted, they stay afflicted. Religion and tradition are the two twin sisters from hell, and they will never help you get free from the problem that you have. Ever. We need power and demonstration in our homes. In our, on, our, on the job. In the church. In the small group. In the bank. At Walmart, can you say amen? Yeah. So there really isn't a separation. Well, I had one person say to me, 
Pastor, are there ever devils cast out in our church? I'm like, you serious? Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are. Really? Yeah. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's not so obvious. And really, uh, I'll tell you the way that we pray. The way that we pray is that, you know, it would just be clean and neat. God just take care of it. Some people got in touch already. Some people got free already today. Tonight. You might be sitting next to them. <laughs> Look, Jesus never, when he set, when somebody got set free in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't ever, he didn't ever poke fun of them. He didn't make say, he didn't say, oh, they had a devil now. That's what they had. They had it. He just dealt with it. It's just life. Come on, the devil's a liar. Now, I, I, I need to say what I'm not saying. I'm thankful for teaching, and I'm thankful for churches that teach, and I'm thankful for, for seeker-friendly churches. I am. Because, you know why there's so many different denominations? Because there's so many different kinds of people, and we're so thankful for the body of Christ. The way that we're wired up here, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and as God moves us along, we're going to operate in them. And many of you have been touched. We've all been touched by the presence of God, and, and, the, and it's a wonderful thing. But, and I love the teaching of the word, and, I, and I'm teaching you a bit tonight, very simply, from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. But there has to come a time when there's real power that's displayed, put on display. You say, well, what happens if people start really going after just the, the power? Well, you're going to end up in some serious trouble. There was, there was some manifestation of angels. We, we've had some things happen here, some, and really... I mean, you just never know what's going to happen. Somebody said, I want to see an angel, man. I want to see an angel. You should, you should eliminate, you should eliminate that, that talk. You need to contend for the power of God. But if you long to see an angel, you set yourself up. You see, what you do is you seek Jesus. You love Jesus with all your heart. You seek him. You, you go to be like him, worship him. Amen. And when you do that, then you might see angels. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But there are angels, there, there are angels of light, and they come to deceive. So I hope some of the teaching that's come forth here has helped you. I believe it has. I know it's helped me. I, but there has, to be a, a, there has to be a demonstration of the Spirit of God, and that's not something you can drum up in the arm of the flesh. The church grew in the first century by signs and wonders. How do we operate in the supernatural? Well, listen to this. First, uh, John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I've been doing, and they will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Oh, well, that's like a blank check right there. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Faith in Jesus the King releases the power of God. We're talking about how to release the power of God. Here's the first thing. You've got to have faith in Jesus. Listen, some of you are like, are you, are you downplaying the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit? We are here nearly every morning, and I will tell you that a morning prayer every morning prayer, we cry out for God to manifest his power and his presence as never before. God, come. Lord, we pray for the outpouring of the Spirit. Signs and wonders and miracles to testify that you've risen again from the grave. We do that. Why would we do that? Because that's what the early apostles did. They did that. Come on, in Acts chapter 4 and 5, when they were threatened, they went back and they had a prayer meeting. I mean, it's a great prayer to pray. Come on, Acts 5. I think it's Acts 5. Look at it with me. Peter and John arrested. There it is. Prayer for boldness. And being let go, verse 23, Acts 4. They pray, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. So the chief priests and elders said, don't ever do anything in the name of Jesus again. We forbid you. And they said, well, dude, far be it for us to obey you rather than God. So you're just going to have to pound sand because we're going to do it. We can't help but testify. 
Come on, somebody say pound of sand. We can't help to testify what Jesus, what does that mean, pound of, I'm not sure. We can't help to testify what Jesus has done, what we have seen and what we've heard. We can't help ourselves. So they go back and they go to their small group and they tell them everything that happened. Verse 24. And when they heard that, they heard about the threatenings, as it says in the NIV. They raised their voice to God in one accord and said, Lord, you are God who make the heaven and, the, and earth, the sea and all that's in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot things in vain? And the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose had determined beforehand. Verse 29, now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By, oh man, this is good. Speak your word by stretching out your hand. Do you know that, that some have relegated the preaching of the word to just teaching and preaching of the word? But that is not what that says. To speak your word by stretching out your hand. By what? By stretching out your hand. So actually, when you lay hands on somebody and you pray in the name of Jesus, be healed, and they're healed, you just spoke his, you just preached his word. That's what that's saying. It's saying that we would speak your word by stretching out your hand. It's, it's both. It's, it's together. Can you say amen in the house of God? Stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were established, uh, pardon me, assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with great boldness. Verse 32, and multitude were there who believed in one heart. And it goes on to say that many signs and wonders were done. I mean, they just did all kinds. That is how the first century church grew. The first step is having faith in Jesus, the King, and it releases his power. Prayer creates the atmosphere for miracles. It's so important that we have an awareness of prayer. I prayed tonight that God would mark our lives, that he would do something. We didn't, now I've walked into meetings and not prayed a bit. Can I tell you something? It's not real good. <laughs> it's not real good. Prayer makes all the difference. And be obedient to, be obedient so that God's power has freedom to flow through us. Minister Micah, would you come? Be obedient so God's power can flow through you as, as a person. I'm going to tell you, God has, God, God will ask you to do some crazy stuff. You better know that you've heard from God. Because if you didn't, you're going to cause some problems. We had a, a leader many, many years ago. Everybody say many years ago. In a far, far away land. <laughs> okay. Really, it didn't happen here. It was a church that we pastored. But um, this leader had been reading this, the, the Wigglesworth way. Smith Wigglesworth. Anybody ever heard of him? Got saved when he was about 40. He was a plumber. Got filled with the Holy Spirit. He would get up in three and pray. I tried to get up in three and pray. I almost died after the first week. Come on, you... You know, you got you to gotta flow the way God's wired you up. I am not wired up to get up at 3 a.m. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody say, praise the Lord. And uh, Wigglesworth punched this person who had a stomach tumor. And, um, and the person got totally healed. So I had, one of my leaders was reading this book, The, Wigg the Wigglesworth Way. And we had a young man who had been on drugs uh, and he would in and out of the church, in and out of the church. I mean, it was support groups. He'd given his heart to Jesus. We prayed, delivering. I mean, it just he just constantly went back. He constantly chose to go back. Everybody say he chose. He chose to go back to all that mess. And so his name was Ted. And Ted was standing up in the front to get prayer. So here's Ted. Ted was about five foot two. He was a slight build. And one of my leaders, who was about 6'1", 200 plus, is ministering to Ted. And I, I watched my leader 
praying for him, and, and the leader goes like this. Ted's got his eyes closed. He looks around. Now, I'm here. I'm looking. I'm like, what's he doing? And he goes, shakatatata. Wham! And just full-on belts a kid. Ted folded up like a sandwich. Fell over with a string of curses coming out of his mouth. What the? Boom, boom, just hit the ground. How many of you know? That was not God. How many of you know that? But there are things that can happen where the Holy Spirit can speak to you. And if you'll obey, then you'll get healed. We had, we had somebody come, and, and, and we frequently have people come, and in a moment, we're going to pray for people tonight. We, have, we, we lay hands on people. We believe in the ministry of laying on of hands. It's an elementary teaching according to the book of Hebrews. We had somebody come, and we prayed for them and that they would be healed, and uh, they left. They were diabetic, and they went. And God spoke to them while they were at the front. He said, if you lose 30 pounds and eat this way, I'll, I will heal you of type 2 diabetes. And, that, and guess what? He went. He lost 30 pounds. He ate the way the Lord told him to. He no longer has diabetes. How many of you know that's a miracle? We've had, we had a, a, a young girl here with stage 4 cancer, some strange cancer years ago. Some of you were here back then. We were on an extended fast. We prayed for this little girl who was ashen. I mean, she looked like she was dying. And we prayed and moved down the line. I remember looking back and that line of prayer. And it was like, all I could tell you is we saw the hand of God. And we came back and we, I said, I see God touching you, sweetheart. I laid hands on her. We prayed. And it was like the wind of the Spirit just rushed by us. She fell down, her parent, not that falling down is a criteria for anything, although the scripture does says that he leads me beside still waters and he makes me lay down. If you want some theology for that, there you go. It's a joke. All right, so they were right here. They, they fell out, the ushers went down. And we were weeping because you could see the hand of God moving up and down on this precious little girl who was sent home because there was no help for her. And in fact, I said over the microphone, there's probably 20 people in church that night. I said, does anybody see this? Some come look at this. And there's people actually gather around and we watched. She sat straight up. All the color returned to her face. She sat straight up and she said, Mommy, I, I feel better. And her mother is a mess. Her mother's crying. And she says, I'm hungry. Now she hadn't eaten. She got up. Do you know that girl's a teenager right now? She got totally healed, totally delivered. <laughs> What about all the people that did get healed and delivered? What about that? Well, look, it is not about you. And it certainly isn't about me. And, you know, honestly, you can start getting in your head about it. Well, I prayed for somebody. I hate that evangelistic thing. In one of my meetings, I ministered to somebody, and they were dead. And now they live. Come on, give them praise, you know. I mean... I really think that we can get all tweaked out because it's about the Lord. It's not, it's not about us. And, you know, we all struggle with... Come on. But you have to be obedient. My son, just in the spring, God spoke to him and said, Dad, we need to go to the old church property. I'm like, that's nice, son. No, no. We need to go to the old church property. Well, by the grace of God, we obeyed. Had we not gone there and the series of events that took place, we would not own the property that we once owned some 12 plus years ago, buying it at 25% of its actual value. God did a miracle because somehow, by the grace of God, we were able to listen to an 11-year-old. God will speak to you. He'll tell you to do things. My son had an abscess, and they were pumping him through, pumping him with all kinds of antibiotics. None of them worked. We were a couple days away from oral. They already had oral surgery, but they're going to have to go in and do something major. Infection all in his jaw. He was on adult dosages of painkillers, lying on the couch, going, oh, oh, on adult dosages of painkillers, nothing worked. When we came to the end, I mean, as a family, we were weeping over him. Hannah was even crying. That girl doesn't cry for nothing. <laughs> Hannah was crying. I was crying. Mom was definitely crying. 
and we wept and prayed in intercession. We went to bed that night. I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw my son's, and his face was like this. In the dream, I saw a little white speck, like a little white head. And in my dream, I took a needle and I popped it. And when I popped it, all the infection came out and he got up totally healed. That's the dream I have. I wake up at five in the morning. I'm thinking, and that's like awesome. And so I, I go and I look at his face and I don't see any white dot. He's sleeping. Thank God he was sleeping. I go back to sleep. I get up. I walk in and now I see a white dot. A couple hours later, I see a white dot. And I said, I said, Pastor Karen, I said, I'm popping that thing. I'm popping it. It's my dream. She says, you are not popping anything. You're not sticking any needle in my boy. No, I said, I'm telling you, it's a dream I had. It's, he's going to get healed. It's true, right? So I brought the needle back. <laughs> I just, I just, and I just prayed. I, my son's looking at me like, Dad, Dad, Dad. I'm like, it's God, son. He's like, Dad. <laughs> I'm like, trust me, I had a dream. <laughs> Hopefully it's like, not like the guy who's got punched, right? Anyway, I knew that I heard from the Lord. I knew I did. I knew that I knew it was the same voice I heard when I got saved that tells me everything that I, that, that ever, when I ever obeyed him, it's the same voice. I took that needle and I, I popped that thing and I thought, nothing's happening right away. I put a little pressure on his face and bam, that thing erupted all of all, all of that. All, I, mean, it, I mean, it just flowed for 20 minutes. The dentist says they don't even know how the infection got from the jaw all the way to the work its way out to his, to his cheek. It came from the outside. He got totally healed. The infection left. The antibiotics worked. He got up and he healed and all the pain was left. You just have to obey. Signs and wonders are not something we worship. Come on. You see this exit sign? It says exit. Now, you can try to go through this thing right here. You could try to go through that, but that was going to be pretty hard. You can't go through the exit sign. You can go through the door. He is the way. He's the truth. He's the door. The sheepfold door. The sheep know his voice. It's, it points to Jesus. Can you say amen? I've got, I've got to finish. Contend for signs and wonders, as we just said. Pray. Be open to letting God use you. As the angel said to, to one of those guys in the Old Testament, <laughs> Gideon, I got it. Gideon. When the angel said to Gideon, You know, behold, mighty man of valor. And he says, go. Gideon asks, well, you know, where's all the signs and wonders we heard about this? Where, where, where's God? If God's with us, like, where is he? And he says, go. One of the reasons we don't have miracles in the church as much as we could is because people aren't going. You have to, you have to obey. These signs follow them that believe. Well, if you believe, then how can signs follow anybody that's not moving? If somebody's, if somebody's going to follow you, how many know you got to go? Okay, you ready to follow me? Well, you can get up when I go. All right. Well, if I don't go, then signs and wonders don't follow. The reason there wasn't miracle signs and you don't have to get up. Signs and wonders in, the, in, in that day was they didn't have a Moses. They didn't have somebody to do that. Listen, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. All you need to do is have faith and go. Believe God. Take a risk. It's, 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 faith is frequently spelled R-I-S-K. Take a risk. Believe. Maybe. It's just an opportunity that God could step into. What if they get healed? What if they don't get healed, Pastor? Well, it's not your job to heal anybody. Come on, I'm just a donkey tonight. Hopefully, Jesus is riding on me. Right. Be open to letting God use you. Look at D. Keep in mind the purpose for miracles that Jesus is glorified. That Jesus is glorified. Come on, stand up on your feet as we close this service. As I was praying, the Lord showed me a number of things tonight that he wanted to touch people with. There are those who have uh, like a racing heart. Your heart races. 
and it's it and uh, it's it's irregular. You got an irregular heartbeat. God's going to heal you. Come. There's any any kind of heart condition, heart problems, palpitations, any kind of blood disorders, heart disease, any kind of heart disease. Going to pray for you. There's also a number of people here that are struggling with depression. You can't see yourself a forest from the trees. If that's you, we're going to pray for you. If you're here and anxiety has been plaguing you, you can be free tonight. You're here and maybe you just want to stand in for somebody because you've got a friend or a family member that needs healing, needs breakthrough. Come on. Come on, believe right now. Believe right now. You need a miracle in your finances. You could get that right now by faith. Depression, anxiety. Come on, we're just going to pray. We're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, release your power right now. Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, all over all the heart problems. Where are you? You've got heart problems. Lift your hand. You've got a heart problem. Step, step forward. Step forward. Father, in Jesus' name. God be here. Come on, let's worship God. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Come on, just worship Him. Lift your voice and worship God. Healing is here. I believe it. And I believe it. I reach my hands into the heavens. I lift my I look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. I reach my hands to the heavens. I lift my eyes where my help comes from. I look to Trust in you. The sickness can't stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power. And it is your will that my life is healed. Sickness, sickness can't stay any longer. And your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power. And it is your will that my life is healed. I reach my hands to the heavens. I lift my eyes where my help comes from. I look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. my hands to the heavens 
I lift my eyes where my help comes from. I look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. Your sickness can't stay. Oh, sickness can't stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power. And it is your will that my life is here. Sickness can't stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power. And it is your will that my life is here. Sickness can't stay any longer And your perfect love is casting out fear You are the God of all power And it is your will that my life is healed I reach my I look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. I reach my hands. I reach my hands to the heavens. I lift my eyes where my help comes from. I look to you. I trust in you. Oh, freedom is here. Freedom is here. Freedom is here. And I receive it. Oh, freedom is here. Freedom is here. Freedom is here. And I believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Sickness can't stay any longer. Come on, declare it tonight. It perfectly. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God. Stay any longer. 
Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power. And it is your will that my life is here. Hallelujah. So all the world is your mission field. If you can't speak, well, don't worry about that. We need to teach. We need to do the best we can in all of those different areas. But it's the power and the demonstration of the Spirit of God that comes out of a relationship with the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we begin to bring this to a close, I take authority over demon power that would try to undermine, that would try to bring depression. In Jesus' name, we command every voice that's contrary to your voice to be silenced today. Suicide, self-hatred, we command you to go, God. I pray that your people would be grafted and rooted in your word. Our identity would be in you. God, we thank you. With every head bowed, every eye closed. One more thing and then we'll close our service. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You don't know Jesus. You've never given your heart to him. Or number two, you've drifted. If you've never given your heart to Jesus and you want to give your heart to Jesus tonight. Or secondly, you've given your heart to Jesus, but you know you've drifted away. You're not as on fire as you used to be. You, you're, you, 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 you know, you drifted and you want to come home. If that's you all across this place, those here in the sanctuary, those online, those listening, if that's you, give your heart to Jesus for the first time or make a recommitment on the count of three. Slip your hand up. One, two, three. Lift your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Want to get right with God? Just raise your hand. You want to be included in this prayer. God bless you. I see that hand. I see that hand back there. God bless you, sweetheart. I see that hand right on. Awesome. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Don't let anything hold you back. Amen. Awesome. Come on, pray this prayer right out loud with me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for rising again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me new. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray. Fill. Touch. Bless. Break every bondage. Break every curse. Release your power upon us. Even as the works that you did, you said it would be better for you to go that you might send the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit, that raise you from the dead available for us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of God would be seen. So fill us and use us. I contend for a release of miracle power to testify, to declare, to proclaim, to demonstrate the love of God even through miracles here in the house as well as in the community, all across America, we would see a great awakening, God, once again. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' holy name and all of God's people said, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance towards you, be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Bless you. We'll hope to see you.